Okay, thanks. It's really just such a pleasure to be here, and uh, uh, it's so nice to see this group. And there's some new faces and a lot of old faces, and it's uh, nice that we're all aging together because uh, <laughs> the alternative isn't so pleasant. Uh, but you know, it, it seems like coming here, I'm just remembering all these times sitting through the community ecology class I had with Jim and and, and, and biogeography and remembering these great debates. Like, is it vicariance or is it dispersal, you know? And, um, or if you think about, uh, you know, should we do it the Tallahassee Mafia way or should we do it another way? Um, and, you know, the truth is usually somewhere in the center. And right now, invasion biology is in a bit of a crisis. And the question is, are exotic species evil and we should kill them all? Or are exotics just species? And sometimes they'll do good things and sometimes they'll do bad things. And there's no predictive power. And the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, but that's what I want to talk to you about today. So I'm going to tell you sort of two vignettes. Both of these should probably be full seminars on their own to really get into the detail, but don't have time to do that. Um, but so as a consequence, I'm going to give you the punchline right now, just in case you zone out for the rest of the talk. So this is the one to pay attention to, OK? Uh, so first, I'm going to say, are all species created equal? And the answer is no. Origin actually matters. And species probably do vary in their efficiency and their fitness, depending on what part of the world they come from. So that's the first take home message. And that's work done in collaboration with Jason Fridley. And the second part is uh, work done with my former grad student, Matt Hurd, looking at landscape level invasion patterns. And exotics and natives often fill up space and occupy abundance and numbers of sites and all those sorts of things in the exact same way that natives do. So sometimes, you know, there aren't any apparent differences between natives and exotics. Both of these vignettes that I'm going to talk about build on stuff that I did uh, as a grad student. Uh, the first, I'll come back to this in a minute, deals with this issue of the paradox of invasion. And the second actually builds on uh, field work I did as a grad student, so really resurrecting very old stuff. Um, so first, the paradox of invasion. I don't know how many of you went through the uh, rigorous uh, comprehensive exam process here. But there was three weeks of writtens, and then your oral. You had a week off to like catch up, and then have your oral exam. But Jim's written question to me was, well, if natives have evolved in a place and have, have uh, had a chance to adapt to those conditions, why can exotics invade? Why can they invade and do better than natives? So that's the paradox of invasion. Um, and that actually led to my first publication with Jim, and uh, my first publication total. Uh, and, um, and I'm still dealing with that question a bit. So anyway, if natives are adapted to their environment, why can exotics invade? And there are a lot of explanations for why exotics do better than natives. Maybe they're missing their enemies. Uh, maybe they're in invading an environment that's actually native from the no from a novel from the native's point of view. Um, all sorts of explanations. Um, but what's not out there in the invasion biology literature is a sort of more basic evolutionary explanation. Um, and, um, and I think that there are some very good basic evolutionary explanations that make sense in a macroecological sort of framework. So most good ideas come from Jim or Darwin, right? And so you, have to, you, know, you think you had an idea and then you discover later that someone thought of it first. So I'm going to read you, some of you may have know about Darwin's naturalization hypothesis, which has to do with how closely related species are and whether they're more likely to invade. That's not what this is about. This is sort of untapped Darwin for some reason. Um, so natural selection acts by competition. It adapts the inhabitants of each country only in relation to the degree of perfection of their associates. We need feel no surprise that the inhabitants of any one country, although on the ordinary view supposed to have been specially created and adapted for that country, being beaten and supplanted by the naturalized products, uh, productions of another land. Uh, so species from larger regions represented by more individuals should have consequently been advanced through natural selection and competition to a higher stage of perfection or dominating power. Uh, and we should therefore be, uh, and should therefore be expected to beat less powerful forms down in other regions. So this was Darwin's insight um, a long time ago, and it was largely ignored. Uh, there are people like Verme and Gould and Briggs that talked about this. Um, and actually said, you know what, you should actually expect invasions. You should expect species from some parts of the world to be able to do a better job than the natives. But for some reason, it was never picked up in sort of the mainstream 
invasion biology literature, I think because it grew out of an ecological sort of background. So anyway, I'm working on a paper with Jason Fridley that's in review right now, and we call uh, this the evolutionary imbalance hypothesis, um, and basically just putting these ideas into a predictive framework. So the way the, uh, this, this hypothesis works is it postulates that species uh, invasion potential varies by region of origin, and we suggest sort of building on Darwin's ideas that regions that are older or larger um, and have more diversity should have produced species with higher absolute fitness. Um, we approximate differences uh, among regions by thinking about the phylogenetic diversity of the families in those regions. So if this framework makes some predictions. One is that phylogenetically rich biotas should contribute more invaders to a given region than phylogenetically poor biotas. Um, one sort of straightforward way that you might think of looking at this is just how many exotics are from different parts of the world in any particular place. But the problem is that we've had vastly different introduction pressures. So you had boats going from Europe to North America, but not vice versa, carrying the same sorts of goods over time, and you could have very different introduction pressures. So one way to get away from this constraint of different profit fuel pressures from different regions of the world is actually to look at the ratio of species, the ratio that are naturalized versus versus invasive. And so by naturalized, I mean species that are non-native, that are living in a place, but aren't so abundant, and aren't pushing out natives in a way that we would label them as invasive. And these invasive species are the ones that are doing extremely well. And if we look at this ratio of species, the invasive to naturalized, compare that to regions, we can see some interesting patterns. So first I'll show you data for Eastern North America. Um, and so on the x-axis, we have phylogenetic diversity of uh, the regions that particular invaders come from. On the, the y-axis, we have the invasive to naturalized ratio. Um, and the, the, these are weighted by the total number of invaders that, uh, that have invaded Eastern North America from these different regions. The blue dots are temperate places. The red dots are, are uh, regions that spill over in the tropics where we've actually removed the tropical species uh, for this comparison. Anyway, what I want you to see is that there's actually quite a bit of predictive power. So species that come from really phylogenetically diverse regions are much more likely to be invasive as opposed to just naturalized. Um, if we look at the same sort of pattern and we look at uh, species from different Mediterranean regions of the world that have invaded California, we see uh, the same kind of pattern. And I don't have time to take you through all the data. If we look at the Czech Republic, we see the same sort of pattern. We don't see the pattern in New Zealand. Uh, and one possibility is that everything beats up on the New Zealand plant so well that uh, that, 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 plant, that pattern uh, falls apart. But that's, that's one possibility. Um, one way of thinking about testing the evolutionary balance hypothesis is to think about what sort of predictions does it make that are different than the sort of standard Eltonian view that we have. The Eltonian view is about niches and biotic resistance. And the Eltonian view suggests that if you have an exchange of species between regions, and there's a similar number of species in both regions, that that exchange should be symmetrical. And what the, what the evolutionary imbalance hypothesis suggests is that that exchange should be symmetrical if the species are similar in both places, only if the phylogenetic diversities of those two regions aren't very different. And what we actually suggest is if the phylogenetic diversity of one region is more complex than that of another, that there actually should be an asymmetry in the exchange. So one way to look at this is to look at data from canals. Uh, there's been a lot of exchanges across canals, um, and we've got five examples that we could go through. I'm going to show you one in the interest of time. But if we look at the marine fishes that have been exchanged across the Suez Canal, going from the very phylogenetically diverse region of the Red Sea, which is connected into the Pacific, versus the Mediterranean Sea, which has been much more isolated, the number of species in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea isn't that different. But what we actually see is this giant asymmetry in the exchange, three times larger than, actually three and a half times larger than we'd expect based purely on the number of species. So there's some interesting implications of, of the evolutionary balance hypothesis. If all species aren't equal, and they do vary in their absolute fitness depending on what region of the world they come from, then invaders may displace and ultimately cause the extinction of native species. So of course that's a concern, nothing new there. The flip side though, is that invaders may increase the functioning of ecosystems and the services they provide. And this is one that gets a lot of conservation biologists upset. Um, it's also one that's backed up by the two or three meta-analysis that have come out in the last few years. So it turns out that systems that are invaded usually do have higher uh, 
you know, higher uh, nutrient cycling rates, higher productivity, all those sorts of things. And so this creates a bit of a conundrum from a conservation point of view. What do we do going forward? If we're really concerned about ecosystem services, we may actually want exotics in some cases. On the other hand, we don't want them if we're concerned about conserving biodiversity. So it's a, I'll leave you with that thought and go on to my second vignette. Um, so the second question is this landscape level patterns. Are exotics occupying space differently than natives? There are cases like this where there are exotics and natives mixed together in habitats. And the question is, do the exotics do better than the natives? So, of course, most species are rare in some places and common in others. Within landscapes, the natives and exotics vary in, the, in their distribution and abundance. And this is sort of the expectation that people have. You know, are exotics found in more places and more abundant in those places than natives? I mean, that's sort of the way we think of what something that's invasive should do. It should do something differently than the natives. Um, so, this is drawing on my uh, dissertation research where I went down to Chile and Thankfully, Pablo was there to help get me set up, um, and some work I did in California, um, but also some work that my grad student did more recently, looking at strandline plant communities uh, in New England. And all three of these systems are, are disturbed by natural disturbances regularly. All three of these systems have a lot of natives and a lot of exotic species. Just to give you a sense, I had 41 sites in California and coastal sage scrub, and in those sites, were mostly native dominated. So on average, there are 19 natives and five exotics at a site. Uh, Xeric slope natural sites in Chile uh, on, were about evenly split on average between natives and exotics. And the strand line plant communities uh, in, in New England had slightly more exotics and natives on average. So I'm just going to show you some relationships. Uh, the first is a site occupancy relationship. So we just have number of occupied sites. Uh, proportion of species, uh, and uh, the, the empty circles are exotic species, the dark circles are native species. So this just means that, you know, most species were only at a few sites, and very few species were at almost all the sites, right? And there's this gradient in between, but what I want you to see is that the white circles and the dark circles, the natives and exotics, aren't doing things very differently there. If we fit some lines through there, or some curves, um, they're pretty indistinguishable. And uh, I'll show you the data for the strand line plant communities. In this case, they, there are two lines here. Uh, they're very hard to see. Natives and exotics, in terms of the way they're occupying sites across at a landscape scale, are doing identical things. The California data, I'm not going to show you in the interest of time, but also very similar. Um, we can look at just the mean number of sites occupied. Um, and we do, you know, if we look at in the California sites, uh, the exotics were slightly more sites occupied. There's actually a significant difference in the Chilean sites. But the difference is small, right? So this is a real difference, 5.9 versus 4.4 uh, sites occupied on average for a particular species. But that's, it's, not a, it's not a giant difference. Um, and if we look at log abundance uh, across sites, we actually see just how similar these natives and exotics are with respect to their abundance. Um, and then just as your classic uh, number of sites occupied by log and mean abundance. So you know things that are, lots of sites are really abundant. Uh, and natives and exotics are doing really similar things. Same patterns for all three sites. I'll just show you this one as an example. Um, and so just to summarize this part of the talk, site occupancy relationships showed really similar patterns. The mean number of sites occupied was similar. Mean abundance across sites similar. Distribution abundance relationships were similar. Um, and so. I think, you know, what's interesting, I mean, the two conclusions are regional scales, exotic origin seems to matter in predicting outcomes of how invasive things will be. At landscape scales, at least in these three habitats, natives and, and exotics are occupying space in a really similar way. And so this, this issue of are exotics different than natives in some fundamental way, I think, you know, not surprisingly, the answer depends. Uh, but, but it depends in ways that, that might have really interesting implications for conservation decisions and management going forward. So I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs>